In this Beyond the Basics video, we're going to talk about top-down inventory control with IBP SNOP, brought to you by SCM Connections. The prerequisites for this course are to understand the IBP SNOP basics. You can do that by going out to the going out to YouTube and looking for a SAP IBP 30-minute video. And there's also the SCM Connections website with various blogs and webinars, as well as any SAP resources that are out there on the internet. The other prerequisite is to understand the standard SAP model that comes with IBP SNOP, specifically around inventory targets. There's a key figure out there that's a manual entry and manually maintained that's used as an input into the SNOP supply planning process. So understanding how that key figure works and how that impacts the supply is helpful in this demo. So in five minutes, you'll, you will see how S IBP SNOP can control inventory from a macro level to drive financial performance. What we're going to do at a high level is just input one financial budget number at the product family level, and then we'll instantly see the output of inventory targets by product and location. And then once you've run the supply heuristic, you'll quickly see the impact of that decision or that constraint on the supply chain. Some of you may be asking, why would you ever do this? And in, it may not be common in all industries, but in some industries, especially consumer goods, inventory balances at the end of the financial reporting period are extremely important, and many times they need to reduce their inventory down to very thin margins to show strong financial performance. Unfortunately, up until IBP SNOP, it was nearly impossible to really understand how best to allocate those limited resources and what impact it would have on the supply chain and how long it would take to recover from that actual event. But thanks to this tool that I'm about to show you, you'll be able to get answers very quickly and then fine tune exactly how you want to spend those limited inventory dollars. So in order to get this to work, you'll have to have some one-time setup. Specifically, you'll need to determine the rules on how you wish to allocate these limited dollars. So what rule base calculation are you going to use? Are you going to use it by upcoming demand for the next period? Are you going to allocate based on high value customers? Are you going to allocate by highly profitable products? So IBP allows you to do pretty much any calculation that you can think of. It's just coming up from a business perspective, what's the, the best one to use? The other task that needs to be done one time is to maintain the initial min and max inventory levels. So you may want to just have a little bit of fine tuning control on, on those product locations to say, you know what, I don't care what the financial limits or, or goals are. I can only maintain a certain maximum inventory level for this product at this location and I can and I want to maintain a minimum level, maybe, you know, one period or two periods of coverage, and then I'll see if I'm over or under that inventory target. The second thing you need to do is when you're actually doing this on a regular basis is to input the product family financial inventory plan. So in this case, we're going to put in, say, we're going to sit, put in $20 million. Then the system will al automatically allocate the costs, those inventory costs, to the product location level. Then you're going to run the supply heuristic, which you would have seen in the 30-minute video, and you're going to evaluate the results. And there's a million ways that you're going to be able to evaluate these results, and there's a million different key figures. Well, not a million, but there's a lot of key figures in IBP SNOP to tell you what the impact of the supply chain is. And then you'll want to do some manual adjustments. Maybe you'll raise it a little bit here and lower it a little bit here, those inventory levels, and it's just kind of a loop. But the key here is that it's all automatic, and so you can do those loops very, very quickly and have some control, whereas before it was just kind of a mess. So before I tell the system that I have a $20 million, $20 million inventory target level at a certain period from finance, I first wanted to show you the data as it sat as it sits before any changes are made. First, you can see here that there's this key figure finance inventory target cost. This was a this is a non-standard SAP model key figure. This is basically what finance wants the inventory tar target cost to be. And as you can see, it's zero across the board. Another query over here is something you'd be familiar with, with the, from the 30-minute video, and that is just your basic key figures for supply, the net demand, what the projected inventory is, demand, dependent demand, how much you plan to produce, and the transportation receipts. Again, there's a lot more key figures that you could add to compare your supply chain, but I just wanted to show you that this is where it's at before things change. And now I wanted to go over to the product family, and this is a simple product family. 
you'll see that there's two key figures. One that's saying, w is this a period that I want to run this financial inventory planning process? You're not going to want to run it maybe every week, maybe at the end of the year or at the end of every quarter but based on financial reporting periods. And then this is the actual key figure that you put in the value. Um, the upper, upper limit of your financial value. So I'm going to enter that and save that data. And then as that's being saved, I'm going to go back to my first query I showed you and hit refresh. By the way, I'm doing this all at the same time. I didn't want to push pause because I wanted to give you guys an idea of, of the performance. And as you can see, this new value has been filled in the finance inventory target cost. And just to prove that the number actually adds up, um, I'm just going to go up and sum the whole thing and you can see it gets very close to 20 million. It's just a little bit shy due to some rounding issues. You may ask, well, how was this actually allocated? And unfortunately, that's proprietary, so I can't really talk about it. But um, let's just say it can, it can become extremely complicated and um, sophisticated, both based on forecast accuracy and demands and um, you know preferred customers and locations. So um, suffice it to say this is just a, a quick allocation of the 20 million dollars. One other key figure that I wanted to show you was the actual inventory target key figure and this is the standard SAP key figure and essentially all it is is um, in in this case, I, I changed the calculation slightly on the inventory target to look to see if this finance inventory target cost was populated. And if it was, then um, I wanted to take that cost divided by the unit cost at that product. Remember, for the standard SAP model, unit cost is at the product location level. And you can see that the uh, target cost now has been populated, and that's the units that will actually be used. And that's going to be the input to the supply chain heuristic. So I realized about halfway through this video that my data example was um, pretty poor to illustrate what we wanted to do. So I did go back, full disclosure, and um, change some data before I reran the heuristic. Essentially what was happening was that I had no projected inventory. Uh, and so obviously if I was setting an inventory limit, it would um, not um, impose a constraint the way I wanted to show. So as you can see, this is before I've uh, uh, run the heuristic, and this probably makes a little bit more sense. Essentially, I'm saying that for this product, um, it had an inventory target across the board of a thousand until finance came along and said you got to cut your inventory, and so it went down to 201. Um, and um, same for the other material, it was a hundred um, inventory target across the board until finance came in and said you got to you got to drop it down to 10. So I think that's a more realistic kind of example. And so I uh, since I have about seven million records in um, this particular planning area. I'm going to hit pause and run the heuristic and then come back to show you what's changed. So here are the results after I ran, to, in this case, unconstrained demand uh, and supply. And I know you guys probably didn't have a photographic memory memorized all the numbers that would happen, but essentially what happened is the net demand in week 25 went down by 799 for this product because the projected inventory was dropped by that amount. And um, it had the same effect on the dependent demand and you can see the projected inventory now changed to 201 and you can see that the production receipts also dropped by the same amount and then you also see in the next week which is great i suppose but then you saw in the next week everything had to jump up in order to make up that difference because um, in addition to meeting the demand they had to have an additional 799 in production and again since i ran the unconstrained demand then this assumes that you can make that all up in in one week but if you were running constrained then it would blow that out um, utilization um, over a longer period of time. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is the fact that um, you can go back now and say, okay, well, if you need me to drop to 201, then I want to um, fall. I don't want to fall off a cliff that week and just idle everybody. Maybe now what I want to do is I want to go down to 500 on um, the week before, and I want to go to 750 the week before that. And now I want to rerun it and see what impact it has. So kind of giving people a break, or maybe giving doing a plant shutdown sort of thing, um, um, and then um, and then try to catch up on the production on week two. So this is where you kind of go back to that analyze the data, then go back to that loop. 
So in summary, um, this is a superior method for allocating targets. Again, we did this at the inventory level, a financial inventory level, but it could have been anything that you wanted to assign and then do a top-down allocation for. It's more accurate, it's a higher quality, it can actually be validated. Um, again, if you're only talking two or three materials, it's probably not a big deal, but if you're talking 2,000, 3,000, 30,000, then making sure that the Excel spreadsheet you see is actually correct and someone didn't make a mistake is nearly impossible. It has uh, faster and better visibility since the shared data model is available to everyone once it's saved or uploaded into a visible version. And then it also allows different business areas to communicate. And by that I mean finance usually talks in dollars, supply chain usually talks in, in terms of quantity or volumes. And this way it allows you to say, okay, here's my $20 million inventory constraint finance. This is what it translates to as far as uh, revenue or law potentially lost customer sales or increased transportation or production costs. The other benefit to this solution is the fact that it's flexible. There's allocation logic um, that can improve over time and can become extremely sophisticated. Also, the, the ability to make new queries and additional key figures as you think of new ways of analyzing this data or a new impact um, are easily done with this process.